Thank you, Chris and Lucas. When Chris spoke with me about a week ago, she'd asked me if maybe I could sing that song again. I said, Chris, I'm fighting a bad cold. I don't think I can do it. And I'm glad I couldn't, because then we would have missed this. That was wonderful, wasn't it? It's definitely one of my favorite songs. And the chorus in the third verse has a phrase that is so powerful. Hosanna, Hosanna, sing for the night is o'er. Yes, this night will soon be over. I guess most of you know what tomorrow is, right? New Year's Day, along with the dreaded New Year's resolutions. Yeah, we do that. We try to make a new beginning. And sometimes we're successful, and sometimes we fail. But you know what? We serve a God who encourages new beginnings. He gives us each a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth chance. I'm so glad he does, because boy, do I need it. But he is truly a God of new beginnings, and he encourages that. And I'd like to look at a couple examples in the Bible of people who had new beginnings and how God led them through this. We'll start at the very beginning, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were created perfect, in a perfect world. Everything was just absolutely beautiful and perfect, and would have stayed that way. They would have lived forever, if only they had obeyed God. But unfortunately, the devil met them, tempted them, and Eve fell, and therefore they were subject to death. But you see, God didn't leave them there. God came down into the garden in the even of the day, seeking them out. They were hiding from God, but he sought them out. And then he gave them this wonderful promise of a new beginning, that a Savior would be coming, and that through his death, to take the penalty of their sin upon him, they could then have eternal life. There, at the very beginning of earth's history, God showed that he was a God of new beginnings. He wanted us to be able to change and to be different than what we were and to become righteous through his power. And so in the Garden of Eden, he gave that wonderful promise that there would be a new beginning available for each one of us. Then we go forward several hundred years. I don't know exactly in the genealogy how long, but we come to the story of Noah. We know that story. Noah was called of God, and he was told, Noah, you need to build me an ark. Now, I'll give you all the directions. I'm the architect of it. I'll give you the directions, because it's going to rain. Rain? What's rain? See, it never rained before. But God says, don't worry about that. You just do what I tell you to do, and I'll protect you and your family. So Noah got together, and for 120 years, he was building this ark. And as he was building the ark, he wasn't just building with his hands and putting nails or pegs, I guess, together in the wood. But he's also talking and he's preaching and he's pleading. He said, the world is going to come to an end. Repent. Believe on God. Turn away from your idols. Because we're told that the wickedness in the world was beyond imagination and God repented that he'd ever made man. I don't know how it can be much more wicked than what we see in the world today, but maybe there's a real parallel there, huh? So 120 years he was preaching, giving them an opportunity for a new beginning. Repent, turn back to God, turn away from your sins, get in the ark with me and you can be saved because it's going to rain. And they mocked him, there's no such thing as rain, what do you mean? So after 120 years, he and his wife, and his three sons and their wives, and a bunch of animals went into the ark, and the door was closed. You see, there's a choice. The people had a choice. They could either continue to live in the way they were living, or they could have a new beginning. And most of them chose not to avail themselves of that new beginning. It makes me wonder, wonder if some of us are like that. If maybe we are not availing ourselves of the new beginning that God offers because he offers all of us a new beginning. Are we going to accept it, or are we going to be shut out of the ark when the door closes? We think of Abraham. 
He was well established in the Ur of the Chaldees. He was an important man there. He had his family and his flocks quite content. And then God says, Abraham, I want you to get up. I want you to gather all of your flocks together, all of your family, and I want you to go to land that I'm going to show you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm traveling, I get my atlas out, or lately the GPS, and I look and see how I'm going to make that journey, where I'm going to go. I need to know where I'm going to end up at, how I'm going to get there. But Abram didn't do that. He just picked up his herds, his family, and he walked out. And he was led to the land of Canaan because God promised him that he would make of him a great nation. But Abram stumbled a couple times. You remember the story when the famine came upon the land of Canaan and he went down to Egypt and suddenly he thought, man, my wife Sarah, she is some good looker. I'm afraid Pharaoh may want to take her as his wife and that to do that he'll kill me. So he told Sarah, Sarah, just tell you my sister. Pharaoh found out about it, and he kicked Abram's hair out of Egypt because he deceived him. But he'd lied about his wife. He denied God in that same way. He also doubted God and the fact that God said, I'll make you a father of many nations. He was over 100 years old, and he didn't have a son. How could this be? So with the prompting of his wife, he took Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden, and had a son through her, he doubted God to fulfill his promise. But even though he stumbled, even though he doubted God, and even though he went against God's will, God still gave him a chance at a new beginning. And finally, Isaac was born. Here's the long-awaited heir to the promise of God. Oh, he was so happy. Until God came to one night and said, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, take him up onto the mountain, and offer him as a sacrifice to me. I can't even imagine what Abraham went through. But he trusted God so much. He had availed himself of the new beginnings that God had given him. And he trusted God so much that he took his son, and he took him up to the mountain, and he was ready to sacrifice him until God stayed his hand and saved his son. And God changed his name from Abraham to Abraham, to tell him that he would be the father of many nations. Abraham took advantage of the new beginnings God gave him and became a faithful servant of God. Then we think of Jacob. Jacob was a con man with the help of his mother, but he was a con man. He had been prophesied that he would actually rule over his brother Esau, but he didn't see that happening. So when Isaac was getting old and about ready to die, he knew that he was going to bring Esau in and give him the birthright, which gave him the leadership of the family, along with the financial, as long as the physical properties. And he said, I want that. So he conned his father by mixing a stew and putting on skins from animals because Esau was very hairy and Jacob was smooth skinned. And he went in and he conned his father and received the birthright. Because of this, he was chased out of his home because Esau threatened to kill him. And he went and he stayed with his uncle Laban. And there the con was turned against him. He worked seven years for Laban for the, his daughter, Rebecca. But was it Rebecca or Rachel? I get those two confused a lot. <laughs> so anyway, it was Rachel. And then Laban gave him Leah instead. So he worked another seven years for Rachel. And then he worked another six years. He was a total of 20 years in exile. We find that in Genesis 31, 38, and 41. So he had this turned against him, but he left, made peace with Laban, and on his way back to Canaan met Esau and made peace with Esau. But then one night... He was, found himself in a mortal combat with somebody he didn't know who it was. He was wrestling with a power so great he couldn't overcome it. And as he wrestled with him, he recognized that this was actually Jesus Christ that he was wrestling with. And as the dawn was breaking, Jesus said, let me go, I need to go. And he said, no, I won't let you go until you bless me. 
You see, Jacob had come from being a con man to scheming how to get what he wanted his own way to recognizing that without the blessing of God, he was nothing. And so God gave him a blessing and changed his name and said his name is Israel, the prince among men. He took a veil of that new beginnings available to him. How often maybe we continue on our life thinking we can do things our own way. We can make it work our own way, but we find out that we can't do anything. There's a country song, a gospel song, that says, I thought I was a real big man. I could do anything I wanted, but I can't even walk without holding your hand. And that's the way it is. And Jacob came to the realization he couldn't even walk without holding the hand of God. Then we come to David. David's an interesting character. The youngest son of Jesse, looked down on by his brothers. He's just a little squirt. You don't need to worry about him. He's out tending his sheep when Samuel came. And God told Samuel, I want you to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be king of Israel because I have rejected Saul because Saul has rejected me. And so all the sons of Jesse passed before him, but God said, no, not him, not him, not him. Finally, they'd all gone, and Samuel said, what now? And he turned to Jesse, he said, did you have another son? He said, yeah, we got David down there, he's turning the sheep. I mean, he's not much of anything. But God spoke to Samuel and said, that's the one I want. And he brought David up. David was anointed to be the king of Israel, and he went through quite a trial period before he was anointed king, and he was a good king. He did a lot of good things. But even the best of us, even the ones of us that do good things for God, we can be tempted. And David was tempted one evening as he stood up on the roof and looked over and saw on the other roof this young lady taking her bath. And she was beautiful to look at. And David fell to temptation. And he took Bathsheba and took her to bed, had sex with her. And then he realized he'd made a mistake. But then he thought he could cover up the mistake. And so he called Uriah the Hittite, who was Bathsheba's husband, and brought him back home. And then afterwards gave him a note and sent him back and told the captain of his host to put Uriah at the very forefront of the battle so he'd be sure to be killed. And he thought that way his sin would be forever hidden. But we don't hide our sins from God. He brings them to us because he wants to repent of them, and he used Nathan the prophet to do that. Nathan the prophet came to David, and he said, you have sinned greatly. Gave him a parable of people with a couple of lambs and one with a lot of lambs. And he said, you are the one who have sinned. To David's credit, he recognized that he'd sinned, and he needed a new beginning. If you ever feel that you need to read something that will give you the essence of true repentance, I recommend Psalms 51. This is David's prayer of repentance. I actually have a sermon where I break it down piece by piece of what it means. But David prayed that God would forgive him. And in verse 10 of Psalms 51, David cries out, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That actually is supposed to read, create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a constant spirit within me. See, David didn't want what I would call a yo-yo Christian experience. You're up one time, and then you're down in the depths. Then you're up one time, you're down in the depths. He didn't want that. He wanted a constant experience with God. He wanted to stay with God all the time. You've heard me talk several times about one of the greatest comforting passage of scripture that I know of is the last four verses of Romans 8 where Paul asked the question is there anything that can separate us from the love of God and he goes through all these different things can this separate us can this separate us can this separate us and then the last verse he says I am persuaded I'm convinced there's absolutely no doubt in my heart that nothing can separate us from God nothing on this earth nothing in heaven nothing can separate us from God and that's what David wanted. He wanted that close connection with God that nothing, absolutely nothing, would separate him from the love of God. And that's what we all want. But we have to pray the 
prayer of repentance. We have to have a new beginning when we can achieve that. And God will never let us down. He will give us that new beginning, and he will give us that confidence of his love. And then one of my favorite people in the Bible, and not just because my brother's got the same name, because he's got some of the same characteristics too, but Peter is a fun character to study. You know, I've always said that Peter's creed before his conversion was open mouth and search foot. Because he did. He would speak or he would act and do stuff impetuously without thinking about it. And it always got him in trouble. You remember the story of Matthew 17? Some people come up to Peter and he says, Peter, does Jesus pay tax to the government? Oh, I'm sure he does. Yeah, no question. You guys think, hmm, maybe I better check. You see, Matthew isn't a tax collector. He would know all about how we do taxes. And Oh, but, you know, Judas, he's, he's the treasurer. Maybe I should ask him if we pay taxes. But no, I think I go ask Jesus personally. So he goes to Jesus and says, do we pay taxes? And Jesus says, what, you know, Peter, does the king of a country pay taxes to his own country? In other words, I'm the king of the world. Why should I pay taxes to the world? But just in case we offend them, I want you to go do something. You're a fisherman, so go down to the sea, take your line, put some bait on it, throw it out, and catch a fish. Peter said, well, you know, I'm more used to catching fish with nets, but anyway, I'll give this a try. So he goes out and he throws his line out. And sure enough, he catches a fish, he reels it in. Ernie knows all about catching a fish, right, Ernie? <laughs> yeah. So he opens it, but Ernie, have you ever caught a fish open his mouth and found a gold coin in it? No, I haven't either. But that's what happened. Peter caught this fish, and there was a gold coin in it, and that was just enough to pay taxes for Jesus and the disciples. But you see, he spoke before thinking, but God bailed him out. But then also, as we get down to the story of Christ's arrest and crucifixion and resurrection... They're in the upper room, and God is, Jesus is talking, and he's telling, somebody's going to just betray me before this night is over with. And, oh, no, no, nobody could do that. And, yeah, and then he turned to Peter, and he says, Peter, Satan desires you. And we find this in Luke 22. He says, Peter, Satan desires you, and he wants to shift you to like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Wow. Jesus prayed for Peter. But you know, Jesus prays for each one of us in a way too. And he says to Peter, when you are converted, and I'm sure that hit Peter between the eyes, what do you mean when I've been converted? I know that you're the Messiah. Because we find out if we look at Matthew 16, Jesus at one time with his disciples around him says, what do men think of me? What do men call me? And the disciples responded, well, you know, some call you the new John the Baptist. Some call you the new Elijah. Some call you the new Jeremiah or maybe one of the prophets. And Jesus says, well, what do you call me? And typically, Peter is the first one to speak up. And Peter says, you are, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus had admitted that Christ was the son of God. But you see, it was here hadn't come down here yet. And Jesus, Peter said, well, Lord, I'll go with you wherever you go. I'll go to prison for you. And Jesus says, no, Peter, before this night is over, before the rooster crows twice, you are going to deny me three times. Peter said, no, no way, I won't do that. So the mob came into the garden and as they came to rest Jesus, Peter, ever impetuous, he pulls out his sword and he slices and he cuts off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Jesus turns and says, put your sword away. He reaches out and he touches Malchus' ear and it restores. And he gets taken off to Pilate's or to the Sanhedrin for trial. As Peter's sitting in the courtyard, three times he got accused of being a follower of Christ. And three times he denied Christ, the third time by cursing and swearing. And as he finished that third time, 
he looked up and Jesus was coming down the hall. And Jesus gave him a look of love, disappointment, concern. I'm not sure always in that look, but that look was so intense that it broke Peter's heart. And he went out and he wept bitterly. And then Peter had his new beginning. You know, sometimes we're like that. We have it up here, but we don't always have it here. And sometimes we do things that might seem minor, but in effect is denying our Lord by what we do. And we need to have that look from Jesus, that look that tells us he loves us regardless of what we're doing, and that that will break our hearts and we will have our new beginnings. And Peter definitely had a new beginning. He's so filled with the Spirit that we're told that when they brought the sick and the lame and the blind and the whatever to the disciples to have healing because the disciples were doing healing miracles that were beyond belief. The people would lay their sick on the sidewalk for the off chance that as Peter walked by, his shadow would fall on them and they would be healed. Now, I can't help but think the old Peter might have said, wow, that's cruel. wonder what happens if I walk backwards. <laughs> Will the disease come back? But you see, that wasn't the old Peter. He knew it wasn't him. He knew it was the Spirit of God. He'd had a new beginning. And he went forward and preached and taught and just was a great ambassador for Christ. And he was always the one that seemed to speak up first. But now he spoke because he wanted people to know about his Lord and Savior, not because he was trying to raise himself up. Then we come to Saul. In Acts 8.1, we read about Saul standing by as they were stoning Stephen. And in Acts 22.20, Paul actually talks about that, and he said he was consenting to the stoning of Stephen. He's holding the clothes of those that were stoning him. He thought he's doing the right thing. Paul, whenever he did Saul, whenever he did something, he did it 100%. He always was full gang out. And he thought he's doing the great thing. And then we read later on in Acts 9, he went and he got letters from the Sanhedrin and the priests and so forth. He's going to Damascus and he was going to take care of those Christians in Damascus those traitors to the Jewish faith who actually thought there was a Messiah that had come and he was going to show them who was boss until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And suddenly Saul understood that he was persecuting the wrong people. He should have been preaching and exalting the Messiah and said he was trying to deny him. And so Saul had that new beginning. And it took him a while to get some of his thinking back in Vrine. But he became a great ambassador. And not only that, his name was also changed. And his name was changed to Paul. And he became a great ambassador for God. But you see, at the beginning of the sermon, I said that God encourages new beginnings. That's not the total story. God not only encourages new beginnings, but he demands new beginnings. Remember the story in John 3 of Nicodemus? He came to Christ that night. He says, what must I do to be saved? And God said, man must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? You mean I've got to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And God said, no, 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 no. Man must be born of the water and the spirit entered into God's kingdom. Born of the water means our physical birth. We've all gone through that, else we wouldn't be here, right? But born of the Spirit means the new beginnings. We've got to be born of the Spirit. We've got to have a new beginning. We've got to be be changed in order to be worthy to come into Christ's presence. But how do you do that? That's... There's one thing to say something, but how how does it take place? In John 14, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure, and he's telling them that he will be sending the comforter when he leaves in order for them to continue to grow in in his spirit. 
And in John 14, verse 26, it says that He will send the Holy Spirit and He will teach them all things. So you see, He didn't leave them without something. The Spirit is coming and He's going to teach them. He's going to teach them how to live in the Spirit. He's going to teach them how to take that new beginnings and grow with it, not to stay where it is. But He's going to give them the ability, He's going to give them the resources to grow. Isaiah 30, 21, it talks about as you're walking on your journey, as you turn to the left or you turn to the right, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it. He doesn't just tell us, do this. He gives us the instructions of how to do it. He leads us. He teaches us. As we are born, as we are got the new beginnings through the Holy Spirit, He teaches us how to grow in that new beginnings. And He'll never leave us just flapping in the wind. If you look in Deuteronomy 31 and in Joshua 5, Deuteronomy 31, Moses is giving his final message to the children of Israel. And he tells them, do everything the Lord commands you, and he won't leave you. He'll stay with you. In Joshua 1, Joshua's out meditating and praying because he's, suddenly he's got this burden of leading this great group of people, and he sees somebody standing in front of him, and he realizes that it's actually Jesus Christ there talking to him. And he says, be a strong, good courage. Don't be afraid. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And when Paul is talking about that in Hebrews 13, 5, he says, he's always said that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He'll always be there with us to teach us, to guide us, to lead us, and to bring us into his kingdom. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, which we call the Great Commission, as he's talking to his disciples, He's telling them to go forth and to speak to others and to make disciples of others, to take the gospel to the world. And lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. You see, God doesn't send His Spirit to us 9 to 5, Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday. He's there always. It's a 24-7, 365, 2,000-some years. You know, He's with us. He's always with us. Why does he do us? Because you see, God's goal for us is to be among the redeemed and, and to enter into heaven. Our scripture this morning, Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for you to prosper. Plans, plans for you to grow. See, that's his plan. He wants us to grow and he wants us to prosper, not only in this world, in the physical things, but more importantly, in the spiritual world. In Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, we're told that we were chosen from the beginning of the world. We were predestined to be adopted into the children, as children of God. Isn't that amazing? We were predestined to be adopted into God's kingdom even as we were born. That's his plan for us. As we, can, as we grow in Christ and as we become more and more aligned to his will... We can say with uh, Paul as he's talked to Timothy, and that's 2 Timothy 4. I need to pull that up here. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul, at the end of his life, makes the statement. For I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not uh, to me only, but unto all that love his appearing. That is God's goal for us, to give us a crown as he comes back to earth for us. But each day, as we work with our daily activities, as we spend time in the word, as we get closer and closer to Christ through these new beginnings, we can truly say that each day, we are marching to Zion, that beautiful city of God.